So thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, we've uh, got the pleasure of, of hearing um, Emeritus Professor Philip Morrison speak today on loneliness and wellbeing. And I had the pleasure of working with Phil for a good five years in geography and environmental studies. And um, his uh, work is well acclaimed internationally and, and locally. And um, he's done a heap of work on well-being of all types. And um, his sort of specialty is urban geography. Um, so it's a real pleasure to have you here today, Phil. Um, we're really pleased to, to hear from you. And so thanks for joining us. It's, um, I'll, I'll leave it over to you and, and I'll let you know if we go, go past 20 minutes with a little kind of chat. Um, I won't interrupt your talk, though. That's all right. Okay, Becky, that's lovely. I see we're starting at um, seven minutes to one. I hope that's all right. Oh, I've got one past one here. Oh, you have? Okay. Well, I'll just um, keep that uh, change in mind. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Let me just check. Have, have other people got... No, you're, you're correct. It's my it's my old clock that's correct, incorrect. <laughs> okay. um, hi, everyone. Uh, hi, Kathy. I see you there. Um, I'll introduce Kathy in a minute. Um, but um, yeah, welcome to this uh, talk on loneliness, well-being, and place. Um, as uh, you will all know, because the media covers this very regularly, loneliness has uh, many negative physical and mental health consequences, and uh, among those is the shortening of life. Um, but it also undermines community life and social functioning. And this is an aspect which has not received as much attention. And I'll, I'll come back to this as we, as we move on. Um, now, interestingly enough, after Becky asked me to talk uh, today, I recalled that when I was at a book launch a few years ago, a local politician said his foremost goal as a local representative was to eliminate loneliness from the city. And these were the thoughts that went through my mind. How's he gonna do that? <laughs> and, and what information would he need in order to do so? And what might be the consequences? So the purpose of this talk is really to um, sort of mentally address this, these questions that I was asking myself when he made that really interesting proposition. And I want to expose some, gap, some gaps in our understanding of loneliness in New Zealand, um, and particularly some of the links that uh, are supposed to be there between loneliness and well-being, and highlight some unexplored connections to place. Now, um, in London, where this comes from, a number of people got together and observed the fact that um, in this huge city, nine million of us, they said, are lonely. And they said, it's time to change this. And they wanted to design out loneliness in our cities. So in a sense, they're coming from the same space as the local politician I referred to. And they have a nice little website here, um, which, um, takes the following form, uh, little um, snippets of ideas and, and questions and it involved the whole community in thinking about what was involved. Um, how can we shape the spaces and places to tackle social isolation and loneliness in our cities, among many other things. Now, uh, we don't have the equivalent uh, of that in Wellington, but we do have a relatively new website that Kathy Coombers um, developed with Spencer Schuller, and they call it um, Loneliness New Zealand, uh, which is, as such embraces all of us. And um, what uh, Kathy and Spencer have been doing is really inviting people who want to talk about loneliness, either because they feel lonely or because they want to uh, help others. And they've developed a very nicely uh, designed website that you can see here. And um, they recognize the many different 
that, that well that loneliness is multidimensional and that you can come at, at it from a variety of experiences and they've given uh, entry points there for uh, for people including covid um, at this point, Kathy, do you want to say anything? Let me introduce Kathy, who developed this. Hi, um, I really, really lovely what she's what she's saying about us. Um, so this is a charitable trust that we've, you know, so we've we've created as an organisation rather than just a website. And um, our biggest focus has been um, to date has probably been trying to influence government to actually see the bigger picture of what's happening with loneliness. Um, in New Zealand, based on the international understanding of, of where people are at with loneliness. So that's, that's probably our bigger, bigger focus with the prevention coming second, and particularly in the COVID environment, and we have a few clients. Great. Thanks, Cathy. Lovely to have you here. Um, so let's ask a question which some people may think is really obvious, but it's far from obvious. And that is what is loneliness? Um, some of the best definitions really uh, are those I've put up here that uh, loneliness occurs when an individual perceives his or her social relationships as insufficient or unsatisfying. And the difference between those two last two words is very important. And I've given some references at the bottom. Uh, it's often experienced as a longing for others, which the individual finds um, adversive or emotionally distressing. Therefore, loneliness is not the equivalent of being alone or living alone. It, a lot of the literature which purports to connect loneliness with place begins with the idea that many more people are living alone. And while that may be a useful entree, it can also be very misleading because living alone or being alone is not the same as loneliness. Loneliness requires a subjective appraisal of one's social situation as being deficient, whereas being alone is an objective matter. Okay, you see someone alone, you can't assume that they're lonely and vice versa. You can't see someone who's been happily married for 50 years and assume that they're not lonely. They can be very lonely. So because there's a difference between emotional loneliness and social loneliness, which I'll get to shortly. So accordingly, loneliness and social isolation are only weakly correlated. Therefore, lonely and non-lonely people do not differ in the nature of their daily activities or the amount of time they spend with others. Now, this makes identification of loneliness very difficult because unless someone actually admits, and because there's a social stigma to loneliness, a lot of people don't admit, especially men, um, you have to wait for someone to admit that they're lonely before you can actually um, have confidence that you have measured loneliness. Now, the very interesting thing about the surveys that we draw on in New Zealand is how deficient they are in actually measuring loneliness. Um, for example, um, this is the survey uh, which Spencer uses and, and, and many others use um, to measure loneliness in New Zealand. And Stats New Zealand comes to the respondent with this question. People who have contact with families can still sometimes feel lonely, while others have little contact, might feel lonely at all. In the last four weeks, how much time have you felt lonely? All right. Now, <clears throat> um, and then these are the options. So this is a temporal statement. It doesn't tell you anything about the nature of their loneliness, whether it's an emotional loneliness, a social loneliness, um, the depth of it, or indeed, um, whether it's a, a periodic thing or a, a something that comes along um, every, every now and again. So the same question is asked in uh, Te Kupanga, the Maori social survey. The same question, interestingly enough. There are no adaptations for, for cultural differences here. So 
When Spencer looked at that survey, he done as others have done and counted up, well, what proportion of people uh, feel lonely most of all of the time? 3.4%. Then he added uh, feeling lonely some of the time, 13%, and came to a figure of 16.4. Well, when you look at the literature, you can get a very wide range in that count depending on the questions involved, anywhere from 10% to 30%. And of course, when you start breaking it down by types of people, those proportions will vary as well. This is the Attitudes and Values Survey. Now, this has produced the, uh, apart from our publication, the only peer-reviewed paper uh, that's come out of New Zealand on loneliness, uh, done by Hawkins Elder. And um, they used a completely different set of questions. They didn't actually ask response, look at some responses to loneliness at all. They looked at measures of felt belonging, um, and they, they combined these uh, responses to these three questions. And of course, they got a different set of, sorry, they got a different set of um, responses. I just uh, got out of sync here, sorry. Uh, right. And um, so their, their responses uh, generated a different perspective on loneliness. The New Zealand Quality of Life Survey asks this question, have you ever felt lonely or isolated? Um, now, isolation is not necessarily the same as loneliness, and it's preferable, notwithstanding the next example I'm going to give you, uh, it's preferable that um, the two are separated. Um, now, in the U Wellbeing Survey, which is um, I, I'm helping to run it at Vic, we did actually ask, in the last two teaching weeks of first year students, how often have you felt lonely or isolated from others? This is because we wanted to compare the responses with the ones above and the ones before that. So um, looking at the results for these 18 and 19 year olds, you find that um, the first three responses have accumulated and you've got almost half the students who say they're lonely almost or some of the time. So even with the deficiencies in the question, that still suggests quite a high perception of uh, students when they ask this question about their level of loneliness. But this is partly because of their age group. And we know that uh, the young are much more likely to um, indicate that they're um, lonely than uh, certainly middle-aged. And uh, even higher in some instances than, than those uh, over 70. Um, and this is, this is why our attention to loneliness is so important, because it's not, not because the, the elderly are not important or the old are not important, but it's actually much more characteristic today of, of young people. Even when we control for education, income, labor participation and other things like that, we still get this higher probability of being lonely or saying you're lonely uh, at younger ages. Okay. Now, one of the important things about this or the under, uh, another dimension of loneliness is the importance of standard of living. Income, your standard of living in general, is a hugely important factor in understanding who's lonely and who's not. Now, the graph on the left, this, uh, let me start with the graph on the right. This is a standard of living score. All right. So the higher the score, the better your standard of living. More to the left, your standard of living declines. Now, when you look at the graph on the, on the left, you find that most people have relatively high standards of living. So the proportion uh, with low standards of living is relatively small, but of course quantitatively important. Now you relate that graph to the one on the right, and you see that that minority um, who do have low standards of living have relatively high levels of loneliness. Now, when you think about this for a minute, what do you need in order to socialize? What do you need in order to maintain relationships? At some point, you're gonna need money. You want to see an old friend, you wanna take them out to coffee, you've gotta be able to go out for coffee, right? You've got people visiting, you want to be able to bring them home, you want to be able to share a meal with them, that costs money. 
all right? An increasingly amount of our lives is spent socially, not at home, but outside in commercial establishments, and it can be expensive. So if you don't have the ability to uh, pay your way, then that inhibits your ability to maintain those social contacts and keep up the relationships that are so necessary in, a, in order to avoid um, slipping into loneliness. So as I said at the bottom there, relationships are increasingly privatized and commercialized, and therefore incomes becomes increasingly important in understanding the ability to relate. <clears throat> so what about well-being? What is the relationship between loneliness and well-being? This is probably the, the trickiest of, the, of them and the one that's received the most attention. In the Hawkins Elder paper, they found a significant negative relationship between loneliness and measures of life satisfaction and a positive relationship with psychological distress. Okay. They also noted that personality dimensions matter. In the paper at the bottom, um, they do a very interesting study relating anxiety, loneliness, and depression. And their story um, goes uh, a little bit like this. It's pre, uh, preceded by Cacioppo's work. What Cacioppo found is that loneliness tended to predict subsequent increases in depression, but depression itself did not necessarily predict escalation in loneliness. So what they were trying to argue, and the other authors established, is that loneliness may be a key contributor to the onset of depression. So their argument, the one at the bottom, goes something like this. Social anxiety, um, the feeling of nervous and anxiousness when you meet a new group of people um, in particular, um, that can lead to loneliness because you tend to withdraw rather than get out there and engage. And that in itself can lead to depression. Now, one of the interesting um, features of this argument is that they didn't find this relationship particularly strong among young people. But as people aged, they found the connection getting stronger and stronger. And other papers will we'll then talk about the way in which depression can actually enhance social anxiety. So we have a feedback loop here, which leads to further loneliness and more depression. Now I've simplified in a very complex argument simply to get the points across. And these, one of the foundations for understanding loneliness is actually um, attachment theory. And the ability of child to attach to the mother and, and, the, and the wider family later on has a very important influence, developmental influence on their um, degree to which they're likely to experience social anxiety. So we can go a long way back in the life cycle in order to understand some of the drivers of these relationships. So at the center of the loneliness question is the relationship question, who and how we relate to others and the extent to which these relationships meet our expectations, um, the expectations and the levels that are necessary for our own well-being. So this takes us directly to the importance of place. Excuse me. Now, the writing on place and loneliness is a little bit weird, to be honest, and I'm probably just reflecting my bias as a geographer. Um, Social connection uh, makes the point that you need to be in a stable relationship. Um, when I say you need to be, I mean, these, they find that the people who have uh, least likely to have loneliness, people have these characteristics. Um, but you also need to be part of a wider group. So there's an immediate relationship with a loved one, but there's also a relationship with a wider group. In both these, but particularly the latter, are important when it comes to thinking about place. Because the most important thing about place are not the houses or the amount of green space or the density of it and all that, but who's actually living there and the degree to which you can relate to them. <clears throat> 
So there are cultural impediments and facilitators of social connections. I mean, why don't we dance in the street like they do in Latin America? It's a cultural hang up <laughs> of us Anglos, uh, of the Anglo society, among other things. And, um, and, and, and we design our, 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 our streets and our towns in order to, um, to, to reflect these, these, these cult this cultural baggage we carry along. Um, and again, the social media can be looked at um, as, a, as, a, as a cultural technical uh, associate, it, it work as a complement or a substitute. So in addition to those social features that are associated with places, there are the physical impediments. And these vary from the very large right down to the very, to the micro. From the way we structure our urban centers down to the neighborhood layout and the housing design. We don't know a lot about these things, but my point here is this, that you can study these till you're blue in the face, but the key drivers are numbers one and numbers two. And that any discussion of these third uh, aspects need to be placed in that context. So very briefly, because I'm probably running out of time, um, we did a little study, uh, Rebecca Smith and I, we wrote that article out of her thesis, and we were interested in the simple question is, does the number of social connections actually affect your loneliness? And, and so we looked at, um, at, we developed an index. And um, the first uh, question we asked was, well, if you had a partner, does that matter? And then what about if you have friends, if you have family, if you have community, um, uh, different kinds of community, um, which I specify in the paper. And then we said, uh, these are our, these are the place-based things, those in the shaded circle there. But then there are non-place connections to do with um, friends, sorry, friends and um, um, non-face-to-face friends and non-face-to-face -face family and non-face-to-face -face community. So we looked at those things. And yes, we did find if you added all those up, the number of, of connections did um, influence. Um, the more lonely you were, the less con connections you had. So places that facilitate connections are important. And we go on to show that the most important of these types of connections were friends. They were more important than family. And they're actually more important than partner in some in, in particular contexts here. So um, friends are actually quite central. We looked at personal income as we did before, but we also asked the question, does it matter, everything else held constant, if you lived in a deprived area, so-called deprived area, versus a, a relatively non-deprived, usually more affluent area? And the answer is, well, not really. The levels of loneliness tend to be higher in more deprived areas, but um, they don't add significantly over and above your personal income. Okay. I just want to end by talking about the behavior of the group, because if anything really came to me as being very important out of the literature, it was this. And it goes all the way back to Durkheim, who says, talking about suicide, where the people took their own lives depended on the kind of society they inhabited. So loneliness is not just about the behavior of the lonely individual, but about the behavior of communities and the societies to which they try and connect. Okay. Now, the thing, when you look at this whole question from the perspective of the group, as opposed to the lonely person, things become, get clearer. Because the lonely, the lonely threaten the cohesiveness of the group. And therefore, the group tends to reject the isolates. And it's been shown in the paper below. There's a very good paper um, by Cacioppo and a number, number of others looking at the Framington Heart Study and the way in which, over time, groups reject those who are lonely and the lonely gets pushed to the, to the outskirts of social networks. Therefore, the behavior of the group is actually quite critical. And I think we under, need to understand how individuals behave when they're in the groups. And what is it about group dynamics that causes us, and we probably all do it, 
to reject the lonely and those who are potentially disruptive of the group. So main points, loneliness is about the quality of relationships, emotional and social as viewed by the individual and measurement is critical. And we don't really have good measurements in the surveys we use in New Zealand. Relationships compound, but they also unravel. Okay. We found that if you had family and friends and community, then your, 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 your um, loneliness was reduced over and above the sum of the parts. The behavior of the group interacts with the behavior of the individual. Place is important at all levels, from the urban structure to the design of houses. Eliminating loneliness from the city, to go back to my, my um, city councillor at the beginning, is laudable, but it raises questions well beyond the assistance of those immediately affected. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. That was fantastic. Um, virtual or actual clap. <laughs> it's quite hard to clap on these things, isn't it? Um, but thank you very much, Ed. And um, just to say, I've, I've heard some of that stuff before and each time it's still uh, interesting and, um, and compelling. So, so thank you for presenting that so well. Um, does anyone have any questions for Phil? Can I just make an observation? So agree with everything Phil said, we've had lots of discussions already, but the, behav the behavior of both the individual and the group is pretty subconscious. Neither are actually knowing. The individual consciously, uh, subconsciously pushes people away and the behavior of the group subconsciously is affected by what's called an emotional contagion. So um, there's, there's quite a lot of um, um, stuff happening that until we are aware of how humans behave together, um, you know, we've got to understand that properly. Mm. Yeah. And just to draw off that, one of the most sort of shocking parts of your talk was the student survey here at Vic, I have to say, Phil, and just in terms of how many students feel loneliness of some kind. Mm, mm. Are you shocked by that or, or was that? Yeah, that, that, that is high. And um, that's one of the many projects we're trying to get into in order to understand. Mm. But... Um, yeah, they, uh, <laughs> this particular um, set of cohorts of first year students raised some very interesting questions mm. about, about our society. Yes. Because it's, it's, it's not just a Victoria University, it's a yeah. manifestation of a wider thing. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and I haven't said anything about social media or anything like that. We could talk for ages on that as well. Yeah. <clears throat> but, um, yeah. Oh, Man, you had a question. Yeah. Man. Uh, well, I missed the beginning, so um, this might be a really dumb question. Um, but I wondered, um, I was really surprised um, when you noted the, uh, what was it about? Oh, the importance of friends over family. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering, um, I guess from a, a cultural perspective, I found that oh, a bit surprising that, um, and I'm just wondering, who who were you surveying in that um, particular? Mm. Yeah, uh, no, that's a, it the, is an interesting participants, I guess. <laughs> it is an interesting observation, isn't it? That comes from the New Zealand uh, General Social Survey, so you know, eight or nine thousand around New Zealand, and that result I think um, applies to virtually every survey they've run. Um, they say you can choose your friends, but you can't choose your relatives. <laughs> um, yeah. and, and you can't leave your relatives either. You're stuck with them for the rest of your life, <laughs> which yeah. I, think, I think constrains behavior. Um, other than that, <laughs> I, I just from anecdotal uh, and, uh, anecdotal evidence and talking to people, I do know that friends bring uh, a, a, a depth of feeling that is very different from family. Perhaps because friends can choose you. Your relatives can't choose you. They're, just, they're stuck from the beginning with you. But your friends can choose you. And the fact that someone chooses you to be a friend mm. 
and continues to be your friend, I think it's a very affirming statement. They can also leave you of talk, of course, which mm. makes it really hard. Mm. <clears throat> so I think I'd be really interested in hearing some of the stuff later in another talk about around social media. We had a number of our second years look at connections and relationships through um, Pacifica ideology of Tava. And mm -hmm. it's about those connections within certain spaces. And they looked at it in that social media space. So I'd really like to hear at some point, you know, or read some of your stuff. Now you, you've, just sparked, stuff. Mm -hmm. you've just sparked a very interesting question. And that is whether this family friends difference that we've noticed here, which is primarily from a, you know, primarily Pakia um, sample, would necessarily hold for particularly for Pacifica communities, you know, would they, if we did an yeah. analysis of them, would they say that friends give them greater emotional sustenance in this sense than family? Interesting enough, yeah. the, <laughs> he says jumping in yeah. answering his own question. <laughs> the, Man after my they, heart. <laughs> <laughs> when they did the Te, te Kupinga survey, what is remarkable about that survey in many ways is how little difference there is in the results there compared to the New Zealand wide survey. There's a slightly stronger influence on, um, on the whanau and on the community, but not a lot more. And so, you know, I think you've raised a really interesting question. <clears throat> Can I just say, um, Phil, I was at a, um... Uh, lecture yesterday on Asian families. Mm -hmm. I think that um, in some cultures, the um, expectations put on individuals, and particularly at the younger level, are e extraordinarily high, and they probably do not have that sense of feeling of freedom that they would um, with, with friendships. But they do struggle to find friendships because of what the family constraints put on them. Yeah, really interesting point. The among the ethnic groups as we characterize them in New Zealand, um, Asian Asian families, Asian individuals tend to report higher the most high level of, of loneliness. Um, and it's not just a function of whether they're recent immigrants or not. Um, mm. So and I suspect there's quite some quite deep issues there. And I think you might have touched on one, Kathy. <clears throat> Any other questions? They were good questions. Yeah, they were. <laughs> <laughs> or comments. <clears throat> yep. No. Okay, well, well, thank you very much, Phil. Um, that was fantastic. Really, really great.